Welcome to Behind the Line, the podcast where you'll get untold stories from first responders and military veterans. I'm Tim Hegman. I'll be your host. I met today's guest many years ago at a 9-11 memorial ceremony that was being held at one of our local elementary schools. At the time, I was a police captain and I was there representing our police department. Pef Ike was part of the ceremony. He played guitar while the kids sang and during the introductions. He was recognized for his years of service while in the Army and as a Vietnam veteran. I learned he had been a helicopter pilot in the Vietnam War and flew the Huey. I wanted to talk to him about his time serving our country, so I invited him to be our guest today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pef Ike. Pef, welcome to the Behind the Line podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, it's a good thing you live nearby. Uh, hopefully traffic wasn't too bad getting here across the street. <laughs> yes, I got across uh, Svoboda just good. fine. Hopefully, thank you. One, <laughs> hopefully one phase of yes. signals, yes. All right. You know, I, as I said, I wanted to talk to you, I want to talk to you about your time serving um, in the Vietnam War and, and um, your experiences while you were in country there. But first, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background? Well, my background is uh, I have an older brother. I was uh, raised by a single mom who uh, my father stepped out of the picture when I was born. And uh, so she raised us in Hermosa. And uh, she worked from, she was an executive secretary and she worked from six o'clock in the morning. She went walked down the hill from 6th Street, picked up the bus, went to downtown LA and uh, worked and then got on the bus and came home. So she was home at six o'clock. And we lived with another family for until I was eight. And uh, the woman died that was taking care of us. And so I moved back home. Uh, so from eight on, sort of a free spirit out there, so to speak. Uh, that's okay. It's a good good way to, to be as a, as a young kid. Well, it was, it was interesting because my brother was older and he started surfing at that time. And I followed in his footsteps and we had these old big... Uh, balsa wood boards that were really heavy and we left them on the beach because nobody would take them because <laughs> right. they were too heavy to take home right. and uh you know we surfed out in front of sixth street and uh and that surfing career added up and we ended up at the hermosa pier and uh in when i was in seventh grade we'd go surfing before school uh, we'd get a big bonfire going all the older guys would get a big bonfire going and we'd stand in front of the bonfire i mean on the beach and, you know, just next to the pier on the north side of the pier and get as hot as we could and then jump in the water and go surfing <laughs> until we couldn't stand it anymore and come back in and stand in the bonfire and warm up. Uh, so I got to hear a lot of stories from the older guys, which I admired immensely, Dewey Weber and Hap Jacobs and Dale Velzi and George Capu and some of these crazy guys, you know. It was fun times, really yep. fun times. Well known, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, during that time in the surfing community and whatnot. So yeah, a different time back then where you could just leave things on the beach and yeah, they were heavy, but you were confident they weren't going to be stolen. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty low key in those days. So, um, how old were you when you started surfing? I was eight. Eight. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, we'll get back to that, but do you have any other hobbies? Uh, I play the guitar. Of course yep. I yep. play golf. Uh, yeah, those are my three go-to, uh, activities. Well, that's not bad, you know. Uh, mine is golf. I, I don't surf and I don't play guitar, but uh, golfing, uh, that's my go-to. Yes. And it's, still not very good. Yes, uh, well, we're not, you're never any good. Right. Whether you're a two handicap or a 20 <laughs> handicap, you're never any good, you know. You're always looking for tomorrow a be better game, anyhow. Yeah, for me, it's a love-hate relationship every, yes. every time I play. Yes, it is. So, <laughs> but all, I love it at the same time. All in a lifetime, right oh, there, yeah. 18 holes. Total lifetime, the ups, the downs. Yeah, for those who don't golf, they don't understand that. Right, but, right. Yeah, but it's still great to be out on a, a right. beautiful day with your friends uh, playing around at golf. So mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, so guitar uh, and surfing, uh, and you're still surfing. Yes, I'm hanging by my fingernails to try to keep surfing. I mean, you know, your ability goes down, and but I'm still out there. I went out this morning, and you know, you get wet and catch a couple of waves. Well, I lost well, times change from when you were ten. To now, um, obviously, you have wetsuits now. You don't have a bonfire to keep you warm. Right. You don't need that. But right. back then, when you were a kid at the bonfire, bonfire was there no such thing as a wetsuit? No, there were no wetsuits. No wetsuits. Yeah. No, they had not been invented. What an invention! 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fabulous invention. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I, every two years I buy a brand new wetsuit, state of the art. Yep. I mean, I, I, I like being warm in cold water and it keeps me in, it keeps me surfing through the winter. Yeah. And you're able to go out there and feel comfortable. Yeah. You feel comfortable. Yeah. Well, good deal. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, and speaking about your guitar, what kind of music do you like? Oh, I'm an old folk singer. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have any favorite musicians or that you, that you looked up to as a kid that you wanted to be, or you wanted to uh, play guitar like? Well, or I mean, anybody. yeah, I mean, the Kingston Trio was a big influence in my life because they were real popular when I was very young and started hearing music. I, I don't know if you, if you can remember a time when you started hearing music, but I can vividly remember the first time it ever happened. I was in a swimming class in, in, uh, in uh, Hollywood Riviera, uh, and uh, I heard the stereo is up on the, up on the wall, the two speakers listened to it. And it was like a revelation to me. I went, oh man, is that cool? Wow. I mean, yeah. it just got me. And you were hooked. Yeah, hooked. <laughs> That's awesome. And I've been I've, hooked ever since. Yeah, well, good. And but, uh, I've heard you play guitar, obviously, at those uh, uh, 9-11 memorial, mm-hmm. memorial ceremonies. And uh, just fantastic uh, hearing you play. And you, you had a partner, I believe, at the time. Yeah, uh, Rick Lyman. Rick, yeah. Rick Lyman. And uh, Amy Fawbush uh, sang with us a couple yes. of times as well. Yes, it's mm-hmm. right. I remember now. Um, all right. So, um, before we get in talking about your time in the, in the military, in the army, what years did you serve? I was in the army from 19, from August of 1965 to August of 1969. Oh, so you're four years. Uh huh. Four and, years. And then when you, uh, were out of the army, uh, what was your career? What'd you, what'd you do the rest of your time up until you retired? Well, I spent five years as a firefighter paramedic. Uh, I got married, had a child, needed to get a real job. So I got a job as a firefighter. Uh, and I did that. I, th- I think a little bit of this issue that the firefighters are having now where they're force hired. Yes. That s- sort of really affected me from my, my, uh, my time in the military because the military does own you. Uh, they own you. I happened to get a great job when I came home from Vietnam, I went to Germany and I flew a big cargo helicopter there and was having a great life. And they sent me back to Vietnam with six months left in the army. Mm. I did not volunteer for it. Right. Make that clear. Yeah. They sent me back. I remember reading the orders with tears coming out of my eyes and just went, you cannot do this to me. Yeah. So it was like they owned me. And the same thing happened to me uh, with the fire department. They, they would force hire you and I would say, I don't want to work. I got two daughters at home. I want to go home and be with my child, my, my children and my wife. Right. No, you can't, you know, and, and it just sort of overwhelmed me. Yeah. So I, I quit the fire department and I became a, a real estate builder, developer, and I've done that ever since and it's served me well. Well, good. Are you a retired or you do that still? I'm, I'm retired. We own some real estate, so we still manage it. So it kind of keeps me in it. I'm still a licensed broker and general contractor, but. I don't do any of it. All right. Well, you know, the one thing I, I, uh, before we move on, uh, I think it's important that our listeners and our audience, our viewers uh, know, is that Hermosa Beach, which is in the South Bay in Southern California, you, because you're surfing, you're actually um, in the Hermosa Beach walk of, is it uh, walk of fame for surfing? How'd that come about? Well, uh, they, they initially had a walk of fame, I think. Uh, Roger Bacon, who used to sell cars in Hermosa Beach, sort of founded the whole thing, got it going, and and uh, John Joseph worked with him, and they started inducting different people. A lot of surfer, a lot of board shapers initially, you know, Dewey Weber, Hap Jacobs, uh, Dale Velzey, Greg Knoll, Bing Copeland, Sonny Vardaman, all these guys that were pioneers in it were inducted and then they started in individually recognizing better surfers that they that had been in, in you know, around for a long time and, and you, you were one of them i wiggled into that one yes <laughs> what, what are you very humble uh what year was that do you remember i think it was 2009 okay mm-hmm. that's a big deal it was a big deal for me yeah, yeah that's a, you should be very proud of that that's yeah, awesome yeah so okay well let's move on and let's talk about your time uh, in the Army and as a helicopter pilot. 
Uh, how old were you when you um, were in the army? When you first. So let me give a little precursor to this. Sure. There's the military military draft. Yes. Which uh, which if when I was 18 it was 19. 62, I think, 62, uh, you know, the draft was out there and they were drafting people right and left. The, the exemptions were for being married, being married with children or going to college. So mm-hmm. if you're exempt from the draft, if you're in college, well, I, I got out of high school and my, you know, my mother couldn't afford to send me to college and I really didn't have any desire to go to college. I just was not raised in that environment. Right. And it, it, it didn't mean anything to me. It cer- certainly meant a lot to me later on in my life, but it didn't mean anything to me at the time. So I went to work for American Airlines as a ticket agent, uh, got a job there and uh, w- worked there and looked at the, the pilots and said, okay, now those guys have the job right there. <laughs> yeah. it, it, that really looked like a good job to me. So I was reading some help, self-help books. I, I'd get, after, after the flights would land and, and you know, the airplane's just sitting there, I'd, I'd open the door and get myself in because I was a ticket agent. I had the key to the door. And I'd walk in and, and sit in, in, the, uh, in a 707 with the, the, the yoke in my hand and say, this is where you need to go. Hmm. This is what you need to you do. You felt your calling. And the only way that I could do that, because I didn't have any money, I mean, was, you know, the ticket agent didn't pay very well. So, uh, so the military was out there and I knew I was going to get drafted and mm-hmm. I knew it, it was going to happen. So I was about 20 and uh, I went to the air force to find out what it took to be an air force pilot. And he said, well, thank you very much, but you need a four year degree to right. be an air force pilot. And I said, yes. Oh shoot. And then they said, uh, I said, how about the, the Navy or the Marines? And they said, you need a two year degree to get to in the Navy or Marines. They said, but now, if you wanted to be a helicopter pilot, the Army will take you as a high school graduate. So I said, all right. So I, uh, I applied. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm in, so I'm out there. I, I, when, you're, when you're 20 years old and you have that draft hanging over your head, everything else is just sort of periphery. You right. know you're going to get drafted. Uh, the Vietnam War was not raging, and it was not a huge issue with me. So I, I didn't really recognize that, that 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 was going to become what it became. Right. Uh, so at the time, I was just thinking, you know, I want to get in flight school and, and uh, have them pay for, for me to be, uh, to be a pilot. So, uh, yeah, that's how it all came about. All right. So you join the Army and you get accepted to be a helicopter pilot. Right. What did your training consist of? My training consisted of uh, basic training in Fort Polk, Louisiana in August. Oh, a little humid and hot down there. <laughs> a little humid and no, hot. No ocean breezes there. Uh, no, and, and I, was, I was a little overweight, so they put me in the, <laughs> in the fat guy's platoon, and they made me run around. And, you know, I, I, after about a week, I said, listen, Sergeant, if I can, you know, do well on the PT test, would you take me off of this fat guy's platoon? <laughs> Says yeah, I took second in that, so it, he, he let me out of that. But uh, that was that was all discipline, which I'd never had any discipline. So this was really unique to me, right? You know, listening to guys and saying uh, yes sir, no sir, and uh, you know, I recall one time where this this I was I was a wise ass kid. I mean, I was not, I was just a s- street smart kid from Hermosa Beach surfer been around a lot of a lot of different things and uh i don't know i piped off to him one time he says <laughs> he says you know he says private ike he says there is a mess hall over there and they peel potatoes every day and i don't give a damn whether you peel potatoes for the rest of the time you're in the military i don't care you either play our game or you're going to be over there peeling potatoes and i went i think he could do that <laughs> Which just it was like a revelation. I went, whoa. He's allowed to do that. Yeah, yes. exactly. Wow. So your career, really, he decided you do this or that. Well, and then it got worse because once I went into flight training, uh, you know, you're an officer candidate. So you, you, they just, they just harass you all the time. The first, the first month, no, no flight training at all. You never see the flight line. You're just in there and they're you're just marching around and they're mm-hmm. yelling at you while you're doing it and I mean it was intense yeah. and and it lasted it lasted for about 6 months through the whole training 
Finally, wow. they loosened up a little bit. But it was they'd slam you up against the wall. They'd they'd take your your uh, your closet and just throw all of it on you know out on the floor and say this is un- unacceptable. I mean, it was it was just like the movies. Yes, just like the movies, and uh, it was it was intense. And that's back in you know mid '60s, and it's changed a lot from what they did to you back then. Right, it's still stressful now, and but there is a uh, a stark contrast between. 65 and 2022 right. when it comes to boot camp and basic training. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I understand. Anything goes. Anything goes. Yes. But it was, uh, I, I had this, this absolute goal to become an aviator. It was, it was, it was the first goal I've ever had in my life, except wanting to be a good surfer, of course. Right. But, but the goal to become an aviator, get those wings, get the bars and, and, uh, you know, you go out and, and all of a sudden your job is to fly helicopters. I thought, I'll, I'll put up with anything for that. Yeah. Uh, and you made it. And I made it. How, uh, do you remember how when you finally graduated and you became that aviator, how you felt? And then what about your mom? Um, what did she, how did she feel about, number one, your accomplishment, but at the same time knowing that you were going to Vietnam? Well, it was without a doubt the proudest day of my life. Yes. I mean, it just was. I mean, it was like all of a sudden they, they pin these wings on your chest and, you know, people are saluting you and you're going, God darn, this is great, you know. Uh, and my mom was really proud of me too. I mean, she, you know, my brother had been in the Air Force and he did well in the Air Force. And she was, she was I think she was really happy that we were going somewhere. Yes. I mean, she didn't know... what. I don't think she had any idea. She knew we were good boys. She knew that we weren't weren't going to end up criminals. But uh, you know, without she, 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 I think she enjoyed seeing that ambition and the fulfillment of that ambition. Yeah, well, that's it, it's great. Obviously, very proud mom, proud yeah. of yourself, and yeah. it beats peeling potatoes. <laughs> it does indeed, <laughs> for sure. So, um, what? year did you you went in 65 what year did you go over to vietnam after your training i finished uh we finished flight school i'll tell you an interesting story i was in flight school and uh this is the month when they're just harassing you we're standing in this in this uh in this formation and you might have to cut this part out (laughs) but this is what this guy says he stands us up and we're all standing there and he's a warrant officer he's a return from vietnam and he, he says, all right, each one of you swinging dicks out there. He says, in about nine months from now, when you graduate from flight school, you're going to be going to Vietnam. So you better pay attention to what the hell you're being taught here. And I nudged the guy next to me and I said, what's Vietnam? Wow. I didn't, I honestly, it just was not in my scope. Yeah. It just wasn't there. Right. And so, uh, so we all went through, we all went through flight school. I made some really, really close friends. And my na- my last name was Ike. My best friend's last name was Elton, one digit away from Ike in our flight class. And my other best friend was DeStefano. So we had the three, our serial numbers were three digits apart. Wow. All three of us went to Vietnam together. All three of us went to Germany together. All three of us got orders to go back to Vietnam together. Wow. Crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But- you developed some very tight and close friendships there, I bet. Did indeed, yeah. Yeah. Everlasting. I mean, it's lifelong. Talked to him just yesterday. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I mean, are they still in, are they local here? Or? One's in Boston, one's in uh, in uh, South Carolina. So we're all over the place. You know, just a quick side note for myself. I was in the Air Force from um, in the mid-80s. And um, I will say four of the best years of my life. And with that, when it comes to friendship, my first station was overseas in the United Kingdom. And I had a group of friends there, about seven guys. And I left there in 86. And to this day, they are my best friends. I don't see them. We communicate and they're in Boston. You know, Boston. But there's something I think about that friendship in the military that it wasn't during wartime. We trained together. We're young. And that friendship is everlasting, lifelong. Well, and, and the fact is that you know, for, for somebody that never went to college, I went to college when I got out of, out of the army. That was a huge uh, must for me because I was living with guys who were all officers. Right. I mean, all the way up to colonels. 
who all had college degrees, and I felt a little inferior to them, and I don't like feeling inferior, so I, so I was motivated to go back to school. But not having that college experience as a 21-year-old, that fraternity, mm, right? that was the military. Yes. Because you're all in the same boat. Yeah. You're all, you know, when you're in Vietnam, we all lived in the same, you know, hooch. So, you know, like 12 of us living in the same hooch, we'd go to the officer's club and there'd be a bunch of people. And that was our fraternity. I, I finally came to realize this, you know, that was our fraternity. Yes. We did the craziest stuff you could ever imagine, <laughs> which sure. is what fraternity kids do as well. You yes, know? that's right. It was, it's... but it turned out to be that way. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, so you're in Vietnam. What regiment were you assigned to? Well, the first tour I was with the first aviation brigade, which was basically a bunch of, of aviation companies that, that rotated around wherever they were needed. I was up in Pleiku in the central highlands. Uh, the whole time we, we, I remember one at one time they called us up and said we had to go down by Saigon to a place called Tainin or something. And the whole, the whole company within six hours had all of our supplies, all of our tents, all of the things that we needed for this basic camping trip and, and all loaded on the helicopters and flew like four hours down there and unloaded and set up. We were there for like a month in a mm. big operation. Wow. I tried to find out what that operation was, but I never could. <laughs> because, because we didn't, you know, when you're in the military, you don't know what what you're doing i mean i mean you're out there just doing your job yes. tomorrow you, you know you go to the briefing at night they say we're going to do a combat assault with you know 25 slicks and six gunships and we're going to go land at this area and we think this the enemy is doing this and that and the other you don't know that that's operation you know dawn dog or something you know <laughs> right that, that that they tell us on television right I was at in my second tour. I was with with the 101st Airborne Division, and I had I had I had gotten myself into the headquarters company because I was a, a, a standardization instructor pilot, which is an instructor pilot that checks out and, and teaches other instructor pilots how to be instructor pilots. Which is okay, a right. pretty high level job. But uh, I, I was with this colonel, and we had to fly out to this base one day, and. Uh, I'm watching Hamburger Hill mm. on television, and it says March something, 1969, 101st Airborne Division. I look at that and I go, wow, I was in the 101st Airborne <laughs> Division in March of 1969. Looked up my flight records, and sure enough, I got six hours of cross-country time going out to Hamburger Hill. Interesting. You know, and I remember uh, I remember th the reason that, that this colonel let me stay in the headquarters. I told him I'd fly with him anytime he had to go anywhere because I knew he couldn't, you know, keep a competent, you know, keep his competence up as a pilot. And he was a rated aviator. And I said, I'll fly with you anytime, anywhere you go. Just keep me here at headquarters. And let me be an instructor pilot and do some other little stuff. So he did. And he made, he made this approach to this pinnacle and, and it was too steep. And <laughs> <laughs> and it's all smoldering, and it's just a mess, you know. And I look at it, and I go, okay. And, he, and he's kind of looking over at me like, when are you going to take this thing? You know, <laughs> I finally go, okay, I got it. And I went around and landed there. But it was, you know, it's just interesting that that, that movie sort of, I'd go, I'd go back to my logs. went, okay, I, oh. yeah, I, was, that's, I remember what that was. I didn't know it was Hamburger Hill right. at the time, but uh, there it was. Interesting. Yeah, you found out after the fact. Yeah. Interesting. So you mentioned a couple of helicopters. What kind of helicopters? What what style? What what models did you fly in Vietnam? Well, the first the first tour. Okay, this you'll find this interesting. First tour, we flew our armed gunships UH-1C, uh, which is which was you know it was pretty early in the war. This helicopter had so little power that we would load it with. We had fourteen rockets. <coughs> We had 14 rockets and uh, mounted machine guns, four mounted machine guns, and the door gunner and crew chief all had machine guns. So we loaded it up with a lot of, of uh, ammunition. It wouldn't hover. Mm. <laughs> so what we would do is the, the pilot and the co-pilot would actually, out of the revetment, revetment had, you know, it's where you parked and they had sandbags around them. You'd lift it up and, and, you know, it would start bleeding RPM because it couldn't, it didn't have enough power. And then we'd sort of bounce it back 
and then we lift, and we get the RPM back, and then we lift it up and bounce it back and get it on the ground, and then we turn it around and we drag it out to the runway. The runways were steel runways; they were kind of locked together, and and then we get the door gunner crew chief in. And then we drag it down the runway until it, it went through what they call translational lift, which is where it starts flying, hmm. not hovering, but flying. And then it had enough power to, to fly. It was, I mean, and, and, you know, I've told stories to this. I told it to some of the Marines. And they said, yeah, we did the same thing with, with the ones that were more modern. Oh, interesting. Because you always just load it with as much as you can. Right. Because, I mean, when you take off, you got lots of fuel. Right. You got lots of ammunition. After you get after you start burning fuel, then 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 the aircraft is easier to fly. Right. Understandable. Oh, interesting. And yeah. to figure out what you had to do to do that. I yeah. Mean, it took some time, I'm sure. Yeah. And practice. Was, yeah. You get used to it. I yeah. Mean, you know. It, you know. Here's a door gunner tr- crew chief walking along as you're dragging <laughs> it out to the runway. It's pretty interesting stuff. And then they finally jump in. Yeah. And away you go. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So do you recall? Um, I'm sorry, real, real quick. What was the other aircraft that you flew? The other- well, the one I flew in Germany was called the CH-37B, which oh. is had two 18-cylinder R2800 radial engines. Radial engines as like, like not jet engines, but radial engines. Oh, inter- yeah. It- <coughs> Pardon me. It was built in the 50s. Sikorsky built it. It's the largest helicopter in the known world mm. uh, when it was when it was new. But it couldn't get out of its own way. I mean, it was it was just big and lumbering and and hard to fly and and you know it it was like flying a barn door around. <laughs> yeah, it was really an interesting helicopter. I loved it. I fell in love with the thing. I ended up being a, an instructor pilot, and then I ended up being a, a SIP, checking out other instructor pilots. That's how I got the rating. So I actually used that to kind of saved my life when I went back the second tour. It's, it's uh, all right. That's... But it is, a, you know, it, it, these engines were the same engines they used on, on fighter airplanes in World War II. So when you would start them, I don't know if you've seen pictures of fighter, oh, yes, yes. you know, uh, radial engines, they, they sort of blow up and they're just a big smoke screen comes behind them. There's a, there's a, you know, your door gun or your, your crew chief is sitting outside with a fire extinguisher <laughs> while you're starting it up and you've got a fuel injector and you're injecting fuel in it and bam, it starts up. Bum, 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 bum. Really interesting <laughs> aircraft. To but fly. you got the mission done. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Do you recall, uh, you talked about your flight records. Do you recall your total time in Vietnam, how many flight hours uh, you had? Or, you know, if you I think pro- I, I think I probably had about maybe 1,500. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of time in the air over we there. Saw, we, saw, we saw a lot of action. I mean, people say, well, you know, geez, you've been in Vietnam. And did you see any action? I said, I'm flying a gunship. You ever see a picture of Vietnam without a, a helicopter in it? That's true. You know? That's true. Hardly ever, you know? Do you recall with all those hours um, how many missions yeah. you flew in? I mean, you know, what's a mission? Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. You know, I mean, you fly. We, I flew the last two months in Vietnam, my, the first tour, uh, for the Special Forces in a place called Cam Duck. Cam Duck was this little uh, camp that had, I think it had six Americans and about 100 mountain yards, which were the local um, tribes people who uh, didn't like the, the North Vietnamese or, or the Viet Cong, so they, they volunteered to to be part of our our action and and we had two helicopters that we that were assigned up there we were in a little tiny a camp i don't know if you've ever seen the green beret the movie yes but there's this little tiny a camp and it's got punji stakes around the corners of it we we were up there living with those guys for two months this is not what i signed up for this was <laughs> this was different i had a, a specific you know, place on the perimeter that, that I was assigned to when we slept there at night, that if they got, you know, if they started getting overrun, uh, that's where you'd go. Uh, mountains around us were about 6,000 feet. We were down about 2,000 feet, uh, just in the most vulnerable place you could ever be, up on, the, up on the, uh, the border of Laos and Cambodia, flying Special Forces guys into Laos mm-hmm. and Cambodia to do recon missions. I mean secret stuff so you'd have to put mud over the u.s army on your helicopter so they couldn't get a picture of it 
you know, that said U.S. Army and it's in Laos. I mean, right. pretty scary stuff. Yeah, when you're covering the insignia, you're yeah. going somewhere that is dangerous and you probably shouldn't be there. Or And, and they give you a little plastic thing. This is interesting because they give you a little plastic thing that has flags of different nations and different languages all the way through it. Probably 12 different languages on it. And it says, I'm an American citizen. Uh, I'm in the military. If you give us help, we'll give you money. You know, this is what you're supposed to give them when you get shot down oh, in wow. some foreign country. I mean, yeah, it just, it was, it was nuts. Wow. Is there one time out of all your time in Vietnam, is there one time that you were flying that, sta- that just uh, obviously saw a lot of action? You were involved in a lot of combat. Does one just come to mind that um, you can you can think of, and the and the and the the circumstances surrounding it? Yeah, yeah. We're up at a place called Doc To, which is another special forces camp, and it was about five o'clock in the evening, and we got this call from these uh, infantry guys who were on the ground, and uh, they were being attacked, and you know, we flew out there and fired on their perimeter. What they do is they drop a smoke grenade and the smoke grenade goes up and you identify the smoke because you don't know whether the enemy has thrown it or you've thrown it. That's green smoke. Yeah, I've got it. And they say from the smoke, you know, 50 yards north, uh, hit that area. So we'd fly gunships and and, uh, fire on them. And so we worked with those guys for until we, we expended all our fuel and all our ammunition and we went back to refuel and they were still in trouble. So now it became night. So now it's nighttime. I'll tell you, nighttime flying a, flying a helicopter in Vietnam is like flying in the abyss. It's just dark. There's no you know lights of no cities or anything else. So right. it was just crazy. Hmm. So we'd, what happened was they would take a, a slick aircraft, one that doesn't have any armament on it, load it up with these flares, get up about 5,000 feet and throw the flares out, which would be on parachutes, and they would light up the operational area so you could see where you're going. Well, a couple of things flying a gunship at night. Number one is when you fire the rockets, they're on fire. Right, right. And when they're on fire, it blinds you. So, so the pilot in command fires the rockets, and as soon as he fires the rockets, the co-pilot takes, takes control of the aircraft because he's going to be plying for a little minute, you know? So, so then, you know, then, and then, you know, you'd start to alternate flying. So we, we, we were operating like that, and every once in a while, the flares would go out. Hmm. So now you're in, in a mountainous area, you're firing these rockets and machine guns, and the lights go out. And you're, you're, on a, you know, you're on a turn, and you know there's mountains out there. And I'm telling you, you pucker up. I'm sure. Yeah. You are as scared as you can be until another flare goes off or until you come out and clear it. Uh, and we did two, two runs like that at night. Uh, and these guys got out of it. At one time, they said, from our position, fire on our position. They're too close. Oh, wow. We're, 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 we're protected pretty well, and uh, so we fired on their position. Wow. Which is... Yeah, that's about as that's about as scary as it gets. I can imagine. That's a lot of responsibility, and you know they're asking for it because obviously they're in danger. The danger, yes. And uh, they're trusting you guys. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I would imagine that the trust within the helicopter, the crew, the pilots, yourself, your co-pilot, the gunners, the trust has to be there. Um, but also the troops on the ground, the trust that they have in you guys to help them and to save them. I mean, it's obviously like a brotherhood that I'm going to trust what I ask them to do. As you say, fire on us, they're going to do it and you're going to get it right. So one afternoon, uh, this, is, this is when I was in the special forces camp and we'd flown out and these guys got themselves in deep trouble and ended up, you know, it took us quite some time to get him out. Finally got him out, brought him back to the base. We get, we're at the base. I'm having a beer at the, this little bar, right? These two guys come in. And these Special Forces guys were, I mean, they're the real deal. Right. They're the, they're the Green Berets, right? They are thick and, and strong and fast. And 
So these guys come in and they grab me. One grabs me around one arm and around the other arm and they hug me and they French kiss my ear. (laughs) And they go, we love you helicopter pilots. Thanks for being there, man. You know, and you're just wiggling trying to get away from it. Oh, all in fun. but All in fun, yeah. All in fun, but genuinely... Um, uh, they, were oh, real, they were real happy we were there, yeah. Definitely, and they were able, hof- hopefully, to enjoy a beer with you. Yeah. Yeah, all right. That's that's incredible. Um, obviously, I mean, from the short time we've talked, um, you know, you come across as a very humble person. Um, and oftentimes, and I respect this so much with with people in public, or just anybody, but public service are veterans who don't say much of what they did or the awards they were given because they were just doing what they were taught to do and trained to do and um, expected to do. And some people, you know, often say, I'm just doing my job. Well, that's true, but just doing your job sometimes or a lot of times deserves recognition and deserves to be brought out so people know because... a lot of people don't know what it's like to be in combat, to fly a helicopter in, right. in, in combat. Are there any awards that you receive that um, you're very, very proud of? Well, I got the Bronze Star. I got the uh, Air Medal. You get an Air Medal for flying in combat. I got 18 of those, and I got an Air Medal with a V for Valor, basically for that mission I was telling you about at night. Uh, uh, in the you know the distinguished service medal and you know the, the routine stuff the national defense ribbon the you know about seven different medals. Wow. I was proudest of the of the air medal with the V. Yes, on that mission, that yeah. one. Uh, well, very well deserved. So thank you for for sharing that with us and and letting us know that. I think it's I think it's important. Um, so you um, leave Vietnam. You go to Germany, you're flying, and then six months before you're due out, you're given orders to go back to Vietnam. Right. And I can only imagine that you saw a light at the end of the tunnel, I'm going to be going home, only to be told you're going back first, you're going back to Vietnam. Yeah, a regular tour of duty was a year. So that year went by when we we're when the three of us were in, in, uh, in uh, Germany. The interesting part about the three of us, okay? So Danny DiStefano goes goes home from Germany, He's supposed to go to Vietnam, six months left in the army. Goes to his congressman, says my 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 sisters are all screwed up, and you know this is in '69, right? You know, and uh, you know I need to be here for them. And he goes, where would you like to be? And he says, well, Altoona, Pennsylvania would be nice. And he goes, okay, you, you know I'll get you an assignment there. So he so he. Did he he got about it that way? My other friend Star was married, and he went, and his wife uh, freaked out in San Francisco, and and at a hospital, and and you know put on this big show and said, "I need my husband home." I went down to see him, and I go, "Well, I'm looking for Star Elton," and they go, "Well, he's not here." And I said, "Well, where is he?" And they said, "Well, we don't know. He he just left." You know, and that a lot of times that can mean he just got shot down and killed right. or whatever. You know, yeah. and I'm going, what the heck? You know, get a letter from him and said they took him out of the army, let him out. You know, and and uh, I was the only stupid one that spent the full <laughs> six months there. <laughs> My mother wrote a letter to Lyndon Johnson, and and uh, he, you know, I got a letter back from some general that said, yeah, well, you know, well, we just need people with experience and so on. Yeah, just the the the, the template. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so you went back for six months mm-hmm. and uh, just out of curiosity, so because you had prior experience in Vietnam, saw a lot of combat and when you went back for those six months, did people like, uh, say, yes, he's here. However, let's maybe put him in the back of the line. So, because he's done his time well, or did they put you right back out there. Well, l- l- let me tell you how it went. Okay. So. This is this is the fastest I've ever been on my feet. I'm going I'm going back to Vietnam and I and I you know, I mean I I saw enough action the first time that I just went, if I go back doing what I was doing that last time, I'm never gonna make it. 
So I, I volunteered to go back to the, the area I operated in the first place, which is in Pleiku. And, you know, they go out and they say, well, you guys are coming back the second tour. Be sure and tell us where you want to go because we want to utilize your experience and everything else. Didn't matter. They sent me up to the 101st Airborne Division, which wasn't even close to the place I was the first time. So I go into the bar and the, and the night before I was supposed to be assigned and uh, I'm having a drink and the colonel comes in, the guy that's going to assign me the job and I'm playing the guitar. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing everything I can to be recognized. Right. And my, my only... My only hope is that I have this rating as a as a standardization instructor pilot, and they have a group of guys in there that are doing that. You know, they're teaching other instructors how to be instructors and in country orientation, different stuff. So now I go in for for my interview. I'm sitting across the table from this full bird colonel in charge of all aviation, 101st Airborne Division, big time job. And he goes, well, he says, well, Mr. Ike, he says, uh, I see that you flew gunships the first tour. He says, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm going to assign you to a Cobra unit, and uh, you'll be with the 100, blah, 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 Cobra unit. And I go, I said, can we talk? And he goes, yeah, we can talk. And I said, well, I said, you know, I was in the officer's club last night, and I noticed there wasn't an air conditioner in there, you know. I could fly down to Da Nang and get us an air conditioner in no time. A case of scotch would do it, you know. And he looks at me and goes, what are you talking about? And I go, well, I mean, I could be your club officer, you know, and, and run that whole thing. And we could upgrade it a lot, you know. <laughs> needs a little help. And he goes, uh, yeah, where are we going with this, you know. And I go, and I said, well, you have a standardization instructor group. And I am a standardization instructor pilot. I said, so I could work with those guys, you know, and, you know, that'd be a good job for me. And he goes, he says, well, he says, uh, he says, the lowest ranking guy in that group is a, is a major. He says, uh, you're like a warrant officer. He says, you're not going to get in there. You know, you, you can't do that. And I went, okay. I said, so I, I said, let me ask you, sir. He said, I noticed you're a rated aviator. I said, uh, I assume that you have to fly. And I assume that your responsibility is in charge of the whole group aviation thing is is a lot of responsibility and you probably aren't that great at flying all i've done for the last three years is fly anytime you go somewhere i will be in the other seat with you and i'll fly anywhere you go anytime night or day you just keep me here and you know you can give me the jobs that i'm talking about but anytime we go anywhere i'll keep you alive because i'm going to get out of here in six months Hmm. he looks at me he goes I think we can work something out. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You were able to uh, convince them. Yeah, and and you know, I had a, I said, I had a friend of mine that that came through, and I gave him an in country orientation. His second tour wanted to fly gun, uh, wanted to fly Cobras, and went to the company that I was supposed to go to, and ended up getting killed, flew into. Yeah, so he got killed, and, and I kind of feel a little guilty about that, but but at the same time, you know, he wanted to do it. Right. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to fly gunships. He'd flown slicks the first time, and he, he wanted to do that. And I actually got a call from, from his brother about, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, because I'd written an article about him just pointing out you know, you're just a number, mm. and you can. There's a, a group called the uh, Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, and they have all the pilots that have gone down, and all the crew members, and all that. So I wrote a little something in there and left my email address, and this guy contacted me, and you know, I talked to him for a while, and he says, "Yeah," he, he said he really, really wanted to fly Cobras. You know, that's what he really wanted to do. Sent me a picture of him next to a Cobra, and you know, and... wow, that. You know the the uh, after all those years, for somebody to reach out to you, I mean, that's a yeah. And you go you go to the wall and in in Washington, and it's just overwhelming. Yeah, overwhelming. Yeah. Find Ch- Charles Fort up there, you know, and scribble his name across it. That's a that's a very emotional place. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so you are out now of the army you've you've done your six months um you transition out of the army back into civilian life and what was your what was it like for you to make that transition when you come to come back home 
You know, I, 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 I kind of felt like I'd done my duty. I'm not a, I'm not a political activist. Uh, I, I went back to El Camino College, got my AA degree in El Camino, got married, uh, got in the fire department, then they had a, a program where you, uh, Cal State LA, mm -hmm. uh, you could get a degree in Cal State LA, I went and got that degree. Uh, but when I was at uh, El Camino, they were having the students for Democratic Society and demonstrations against Vietnam. I mean, this is 1969 when I got out. Right. You know, and it was at the height of it, 69, 70, 71, 72. It was craziness. But, you know, I'd, I'd done my duty. I, I, did not, I did not hold anybody, uh, I did not feel any, any anxiety or any remorse or any feelings towards those people. I felt that they had the right to do what they were doing. And, uh, you know, I just, I just when, when I got back from Vietnam, you did not talk about Vietnam. You did not talk about it with anybody. Number one, because all of the exemptions were people that were going to college. Right. right. So you were kind of considered the dumb shit. Mm. You know, well, why'd you, go to, why'd you go in the army? I mean, come on, you, weren't you in college or doing something, you know, worthwhile? And, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like that sort of a feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah, you kept, you just didn't talk yeah, about so it. Yeah, so you just kept it to yourself. Um, so um, you're going to school at El Camino, uh, you, you end up getting your degree at Cal State LA, uh, I'm assuming that um, you continue to surf when you got back. Was that like the the first time when you got out and you came home, knowing that how important and how much you enjoyed surfing? Do you recall that first time you went back in the water to surf? Well, I recall uh, walking into Dewey Weber's shop. Dewey Weber, I, I was friends with. I knew him well. I was on his competition team when we actually invented his competition team in '63. Uh, and I walked into his shop, and he, and he looked at me, and he says, Hey, Pef, you're back. Cool. He says, you know, he looks around at his store. His store's got hundreds of surfboards. And he says, take a look around. Take any board in the store. Wow. And I went, really? He says, yeah, take any board in the store. It's yours. Thanks for your service. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, Dewey meant a lot to me. He was, he was a good guy. And where was his shop at? This is when his shop was in uh, Venice. Venice. And so you get aboard, and did you go back, the first time you went back to surf, did you go to your same, your regular spot, or did you go somewhere different? I went down to Hermosa, or, or pardon me, the Manhattan Pier, yep. where I surfed with all my buddies. Uh, saw a couple of guys, they had leashes, which they didn't have you know, before, and I'm going, that's interesting. <laughs> a leash, hmm, that could work. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a, it's a, another great invention. It is a great invention, yeah. You know. But it, it was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I was working going to school, so I was, you know, I was full-time into being getting my education. So I was surfing periodically, but not not like I do now where I go in every day. And um yeah, the fact that you're able to do it even now is something that you like playing guitar, surfing, Two things you've you started as a young boy, and you're still able to do those two yep, things. Yep. Yeah. And golf. And golf. Yeah. Golf is great for that. The golf. So. The greatest thing about golf is the handicap. Oh yeah, yeah. That's you right. Know, you can play with guys that are great, and you get a handicap, and you can still compete. Yes. Which is which is a unique thing to. I don't know any other sport that you can do that. It's a great system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. So, um, what about uh, now? Do you do work to um, with um, veterans? I know you had mentioned uh, before we went on camera. Um, you work with some Marines. I'm assuming is that down at Camp Pendleton? Yes, but I don't do that anymore. You don't do that. So I, what what was what did you do and what was that all about? Well, uh, you know when I was when I could do it, I, I'd go down there and help train train them how to surf. You know, they, they have a whole battalion of uh, wounded warriors that are active military that are in various stages of disrepair, mm. uh, from PTSD uh, to wounds that they're recovering from. Um, and and they, Jimmy Miller, the foundation, established a, a, a rapport with, those, with the Marines and said, we'll come down there and do therapy for your, for your wounded Marines and we'll teach them how to surf. And so they they did that, uh, and it, it, it was a it was a very interesting time for me because 
I would I would be around uh, you know maybe three or four guys that would be talking about Felucia mm. or something else you know and they all knew I was a veteran so they were free to talk any any way they wanted and they had some crazy crazy stories I'll tell you war war will bring out the worst in a human being it, there's something about it that that you're just you're on your own and nobody's going to tell you right from wrong you know they're going to they're going to try but you know you send a you send a bunch of people out there armed and dangerous it's different than the, the police department yes. you know the different the difference between the police department is you're trying to keep keep things going right i mean sometimes things go out of control uh in war and, and you know that's you can see it happening in Ukraine right now. It's just these kids; these kids are doing these atrocities, and and the other side, it just makes different people out of them. And and you'll, you're never the same. You're never the same. Yes, uh, it's it's um, and these are young young people. Yeah, you know, some of them just out of high school, yep. eighteen, nineteen. Yep. Uh, that are like in Vietnam, uh, Fallujah, uh, Afghanistan, uh, current day. You know, or most recently. Or most recent, I'm sorry, and then Ukraine. Um, you know, these are these are young people who, um, after their service, like you said, they come out, and if they don't have physical wounds, they're going to have some emotional right, wounds, right? And that PTSD, and I think the difference today compared to before, and it's the same way in in uh, public service of so firefighter, police officers, you know, back. Years ago, many years ago, you would uh, be involved in a uh, horrific event, or you'd witness something that was just horrific. Uh, you may have been involved in it. You may have just seen it, um, even after the fact. And with our soldiers and the Marines and the airmen uh, being young, witnessing those things or being involved, uh, that doesn't go away from you. No, and and you know this PTSD, uh, it, I see it. I, I see it in in the fire department and and the police department. I mean, it's out there. You yes. guys are seeing stuff that you don't, you shouldn't see. Just atrocities that are just mind boggling. Yes, and, and it's the same thing in war. It's the same thing. You can tell somebody about it, and they may go, "Oh, you know," they may be able to visualize it. But it's different than being there and actually being right there when that happened and what you witnessed. And sometimes you question, did I just see that? Did, I, did that really happen? Well, and, and the other thing is that when you're involved in it, you're involved in it. So you're watching it with, with your mind racing to where do I go? What do I do? How do I handle this? What do I do? That? I mean, flying a helicopter. You cannot get emotional flying a helicopter. You right. have let me just tell you that when you fire two rockets on a on, on the helicopters we were flying, when you fire those rockets, they're mounted to the aircraft. That aircraft has to be flown perfectly for those rockets to go where they're where they're supposed to go. If you have a little too much pedal on one side or the other, the rockets come out and then turn radically one way or the other. Mm. So so it just doesn't work. So you you're you're flying in into a into a say a fifty caliber machine gun that's shooting at you. And you're you're sitting there. You're going. You're watching the little ball over there. So make sure the ball's in the center, so that you don't have too much, you know, pedal in one side or the other. And you're flying right into the into the barrel of the of the gun that's shooting at you. Mm. And then you fire the rockets, and they go where they're supposed to go. But if you don't, they don't. Right. And and so so your mind is not is not thinking about that that bullets are coming at you. Your mind is thinking about firing back at that. Yeah. But then you get back and you start thinking about it and you go, holy moly. Yeah. Yeah. That, After the fact. Yeah. So, and same thing with the fire department and the police department. You go out there and you have a job to do and you can't, you can't sit there and say, man, this is scary. Right. You know? Yeah. And I, I th you're spot on. And I think the difference between back then in, in the Vietnam, in Vietnam and, you know, many years ago, even in police work and firefighting. Um, to today is it's become very important the wellness of our military our first responders 
it's been recognized that there's issues. There's a lot of programs in place to try to address those issues to help the men and women who were exposed or involved. And, and I think, you know, with the Jimmy Miller uh, Foundation, um, the Jim, what you were involved in, the Jimmy Miller Memorial Foundation's Ocean Therapy Program, what a great way to give back to our Marines right. um, who have suffered in many different ways to put them in the water, to, well, to be able to communicate with them because yeah. you're a veteran too, yeah. and to hear their stories and, and understand and yet take your time to be in, in the water and let them experience the, the freeness of surfing. Yeah, and, and they're not thinking about the issues. They're, they're out there in the ocean and trying to figure out how to ride a wave, and their mind is a, a million miles away from, from war. <clears throat> I had a guy when, you know, on this whole thing, and I, I ended up starting, you know, as, as, I got, as I got older working with them, I said, well, I'll go outside and, and, and teach them the, the, the fine things about, you know, being outside and catching waves as opposed to pushing them into waves. Mm. And so I, you know, I was out there and I was out there with this guy one time and I said, okay, you know, you need to sink the tail a little bit to take off on the wave and then, and then go in. And he goes, he says, you know what? He says, I just like being out here, man. Yeah. I went, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Yes. You know, he just was not that enthusiastic about surfing. He just wanted to be in the ocean, floating around and thinking about nothing. Yeah. Yeah. What's some of the feedback you've you received or any comments you received from the Marines that went through the program? Well, I've had guys say it saved their life. Hmm. I've had guys say, listen, I was just sitting in the barracks, playing video games, doing nothing. Now I'm getting up, I'm going out, I'm going out and surf by myself, you know. I mean, there are guys that it has actually saved their lives. Um, although you're not involved in the program, do you know if the program is it still exists? Oh, yeah. they st- they're still doing it. It's still it, yeah. They do it for veterans. They do it for uh, they do it in in Camp Pendleton. They do it at at, at uh, El Porto. Oh, and they do it okay. for children, and you know various children. Uh, they're 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 a great organization. I still support them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's fantastic. It's, it's great. just I'm, it's just I'm too old to participate in it. But you're there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some music real quick, but also at the same time, uh, your time in Vietnam. So you, uh, wrote a song called Sons and Daughters. Yes. And, um, why don't you, why don't you tell us about that song, how it came about and, you know, the meaning of the song and what it means to you. Well, that song, it's, it's kind of a, a story of my life, basically, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, Jim Miller asked me, you know, he, he was talking about doing some things, and, and I said, well, maybe I could write a song, you know, and, and include the, what we're doing with the Marines. And uh, so I, I started thinking about it, and I thought, well, you got to kind of start somewhere. So I started basically with my life and being in Vietnam and some pictures of the helicopters flying and that sort of thing. And then as I thought about it, uh, and my 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 trip through life, uh, I got to the part about about the uh, the Marines, and I thought, you know, this is this is an important thing for them. It's an important thing for them, and uh, I felt I felt a real obligation to to because I'm I'm pretty together. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not homeless or wiped out by all of it, you know, I, I felt it important to, to relay some of that to them. So the, it was a, it was a great thing, great thing for me. Who'd you uh, dedicate the song to? Who do I dedicate that song to? I never thought of that. I mean, I would dedicate the song to my wife. Yes. You know, I mean, my wife and my daughters, cause they saved my life. You know, they're the ones that, uh, you know, my, my, my family is, I've been married for 51 years and my wife is, is, is the greatest person I know. And, and, you know, all of that, did, all of it came about because of her. Mm. She is, she is my moral compass. She brought me back into reality and, and sort of just guided me along, you know, put up with me, but, you know, I kind of saw her way a little bit and I thought, I'd like to be going in that direction as opposed to the other direction. Yeah. So she saved your life and, and you say your two daughters? Yes. 
they're they're obviously older, uh, married. Yeah, grandchildren. Yeah, I'm blessed. I'm I'm very blessed. It's good that you recognize that a lot of people don't realize what they have, uh, oh. but the fact that you do. Well, I come from humble beginnings, and uh, I, you know I've I've been more than paid back for all of that. Um. Well, I, I've I've watched that video, uh, sons and daughters, it's on YouTube. Matter of fact, we're going to put that uh, the information on our sh- in our show notes so people um, listening and watching uh, can look at you know watch the video. I've watched it a number of times. I think it's phenomenal. It's perfect. I look a little old in it, you know. No, I don't think so. No, I think you <laughs> you did a great honestly. You, you did a great job uh, with a video, so we'll put that down below. We'll also put some information uh, in the show notes on the Jimmy, Mel- Jimmy Miller Foundation mm-hmm. so people can you know reference that and know what we're talking about and the great work um, that that organization does yeah. and, and continues to do um, for people. Well, before we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to say or uh, add? And if you're so great, if not, all is good. Well, I just, you know, I'd like to say that, 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 you know, the military, I was in the military for four years. You guys are in, in the police department for 30 years. You guys do a job. Uh, the, the, the policemen and the firefighters, I mean, they're the most important people when you need them. You know, they're the most important people when you need them in the world. And uh, I, I, I want to thank you for your service. Mm. I want to thank you for your service in, in the Air Force. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that military discipline that you get that, that sort of sets you on a little, a little finer of a track than where you are before that. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the kind words. Uh, thank you. And you are exactly right. I mean, I did 33 years in um, law enforcement. Loved it. Uh, very rewarding. My four years in the military, it's different. And it those are those four years are, are still long ago, but very um, important to me and very close to my heart. I just, um, I could say four of the best years of my life. And I've lived a very good life. Well, thank you for the cathartic uh, <laughs> moment here. Yes. You know, d- discussing all of this. Uh, I don't do it very often, but uh, I appreciate your hearing me out. Yeah, no, this is great. We could go on and on. So, uh, but Pef, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, for this, um, you know, on behalf of a, uh, grateful nation. And I mean that, uh, thank you for your service, um, your courage and your dedication, um, for all that you, you did, um, you know, while you served in the army, but also what you continue to do after the army and up until recently with the Jimmy Miller Foundation. Um, it takes a special person, and uh, uh, you need to be recognized for that, as do so many, if not all, of our veterans um, of all the different wars and our current military uh, officers. So, again, thank you for taking the time. It's been a pleasure to have you here, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure myself. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like the show please follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the show notes from each episode, visit BehindTheLinePod.com. If you want to support the show and hear more from our first responders and military veterans, head over to Patreon.com slash BehindTheLine. I'll see you on the next one.